In 2001, Coral Ridge Ministries, I don't know if you're familiar with Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, but in the 90s, perhaps before the 90s, but I don't know about it because I wasn't here, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church had a group called the Coral Ridge Ministries, and it was a national syndicated TV and radio broadcasting hoo-ha. I don't really know too much about it, except that it was right here in Fort Lauderdale, and it was a site for frequent, you know, demonstrations. Uh, Guard was that I spoke of before, the Gays United Against Repression and Discrimination would hold marches there from time to time, and uh, it was a great thing to be against, and it, they deserve to be, <laughs> to be uh, opposed. But in any event, um, the Coral Ridge Ministries, together with the Center for Reclaiming America, um, which was significant, decided to bring a, a to do a, peti a, you know, a petition referendum to repeal the human rights ordinance as it pertained to sexual orientation. So now it's 2001. The ordinance has been in effect since 19, June of 1995. So it's six years later. We did some polling. Well, it isn't exactly, we didn't start off doing polling, but in any event, so, so this happened. And then the gay community was like, well, damn, you know, what are we gonna do? Because the dolphins, the dolphins pretty much waned after the whole gender parity, boo ha ha. There was nothing happening there. Their people, their membership fell off. People, people navigate away from discord. So it wasn't happening there. That wasn't where the leadership was. And they really, who was the leaders? Um, I'm not really sure what Dean was doing at that time. I think that he was getting himself ready, whatever. He, well, he didn't take a, he didn't step forward at that time. He was doing something else. But so we had some meetings and uh, the old Americans for Equality, of course, uh, name came up and, you know, we said, well, let's put that cloak back on. Um, I, at that time, in keeping with, you know, my tendency, first of all, I was trying to build a, a law practice and I really, you know, wasn't uh, anxious to get back into, you know, any kind of a leadership position. Um, so, we, so, the, so Americans for Equality reformed, and Terry DiCarlo and Karen Dell Woolman were co-chairs. Um, I was on the committee, and you know, and we inched along trying to decide, you know, how we were going to do this. And when I was, you know, I don't really remember a lot about that. That. It was really, it was in January of 2001 that they announced that they were going to begin this uh, repeal effort. And um, I didn't really remember the first few months of it until I looked at my notes, but it was uh, not a happy time for the gay community because we were foundering. We didn't have any real organization. So it was just those of us who showed up. We, I mean, we, the first meeting we had was at the uh, GLCC, the Gay and Lesbian Community Center. And 100 people showed up. So there were people that were, you know, the, we were there, but the leadership really wasn't there in the beginning. Um, and, I, and they announced in March that, uh, so what happens with that petition referendum process is, is that, so the group says, okay, we're gonna do this, but then they have to formally file their paperwork with the county, which kicks off, they then kicks off the clock to begin to run that they then have six months to collect the signatures. Well, remember it was 46,000 signatures in 1995 they needed. By 2001 they needed 66, 66,446 to be exact. <laughs> and um, so it was in March that the clock started to run. And I have a newspaper, I noticed a new newspaper article that said, oh, gay community in disarray. <laughs> it's like, this is like, oh no, right? So I really don't remember exactly how it came to pass, but Americans for Equality ended up being me as the chair, Bill Redinger as, uh, I believe he was the treasurer, and uh, we, uh, Richard Giorgio from Palm Beach as a consultant joined us this time because we were poor. Uh, we didn't pay him. And uh, 
I want to say their names because it's important that they be remembered. Helen Werner, um, she's a, a nursing a PhD nurse, a nursing professor. Phyllis uh, Kessler, who is a PFLAG, you know, Parents and Friends of Gays, had always been a great ally, and she worked with us. And she just died a few, I think, last week. Christine Lane, who is um, actually, she works for the IRS <laughs> in Washington, D.C., was a 19-year-old student at the University of Miami at the time, Jen Woodward and Mark Dickerson. That was our board, and we met every week for nine, I want to say at least six months. I don't know exactly. It might have been eight months in my conference room here in this building. And it was a huge struggle because this time around, the opposition was not naive. This time around, American, the Center for Reclaiming America was, uh, you know, I may have that name wrong, but in any event, national anti-gay groups were well-versed in how to take down a human rights ordinance. It had been done several times around the United States. Every time they brought the, they sought the petitions, they got the petitions, they put it on the ballot, and the gays lost. That was happening around the United States. They had a method, they had the money, and they were gonna do it to us. So this was really a David and Goliath struggle because while in 1995, we had recently done all that public relations work with the gay community so that when we needed them, they were there with the money, the fundraisers, they were throwing money at us. In 2001, not so much. The dolphins had faded off. They were not helping us. I probably they probably weren't even talking to me, but you know I'm kidding. They that's not true, but that's an exaggeration. But you know that wasn't a, an a, a avenue for us. So we were it was it was tough and it was a a rugged fight. Um, the what happened was they were well funded. Um, what's the name of that church? Calvary Chapel alone. Uh, and they, and so everybody's registered their packs. So we so we all know how much money they know how much money we have. We know how much they have. We know where it came from. And Calvary Chapel alone gave them a hundred thousand dollars. And they were getting money from out of state as well. But more importantly, they were getting they were being directed from out of state. Their campaign was led by a, a group out of California. And so it was professionally run, and they were not. Um, just going out with petitions and saying, sign this to get rid of gay rights. They were, <laughs> they were, um, what they were doing is, first of all, it wasn't local people who were uh, collecting signatures. They had professional petition gatherers phone in from all over the United States and they were actually paying for, for each signed petition, each uh, they were paying. And it started out to be like one, two, three dollars. And by the time we were on the eve of the election, it was $16 per petition. So of course, these paid sig signature gatherers were forging like crazy the uh, petitions because they were making a lot of money doing it. We saw them doing it at, on site. What we um, are really, aside from public education, which really when you're, Fighting uh, a petition referendum battle, yes, you want to educate the public that there you may be presented with a petition, and if you and if you are presented with it, decline to sign. So you want to do that, and we did that. However, no matter how much publicity you put out there saying decline to sign, in fact, if you're in the grocery store and you walk out and somebody approaches you when you're on the way to your car and they hand you they say, hi, you know, can you help me out here today? I've got a petition that says we want to limit classroom size, and I've got a petition, I forget what the second one was, and then I've got another petition here to save the Boy Scouts. Can you help me out and sign this? And you sign it. Even if you just saw a bus that said on the back of it, decline to sign, you know, who's looking at the back of the bus, really? You know, 
there's just so much you can do. So what it really comes down to is boots on the ground to be there. So what we also knew is that if somebody approaches you in the parking lot and says, will you sign this? If somebody else walks up and say, oh, please don't sign that. <laughs> the guy's, the person's going to say, oh, never mind, I got to go. Because they don't want to be involved in that. You know, they just don't. You don't even have to say, please don't sign this. Don't you like gay people? You don't have to say that. <laughs> you, know, you know, you just have to say, you know, please don't sign that. It's not, it's not a good thing. And, and they won't sign. So do we have enough boots on the ground to go to ev find, be at every Walmart, every CVS pharmacy, every Walgreens, every Publix, every courthouse, every place where people are walking on a daily basis to be approached by a professional petition gatherer from California, Chicago, Denver, coming in from all over. These people that professionally go door to door and ask you for money, that kind of thing, that's, that's who these people are. Um, I know because I used to run canvases in the neighborhoods of San Francisco Bay Area collecting money um, for the Berkeley Women's Center. So I know exactly who these people are because I used to hire them, train them, and I was one. So, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, so it was a big deal. So what we had to do is, no, we didn't have the boots on the ground to be everywhere and eyes to be everywhere that the signature gathers could be. So what we did was we approached the corporations, the heads of Publix and Walmart and Walgreens and just about at Kmart, you name it, and said, you've got these freaks on your grounds bothering your patrons for anti-gay reasons and you need to, like, ban them. And that's what we did and that's what really did not prevent them from getting the signatures. However, it prevented them from getting 90,000 so that when the day came, we prevented, in the end, they, they, it was the only place that they could really get signatures was like at, what they had were regularly at all the courthouses because you can't ban, the courthouses couldn't ban them from being on those grounds. And public events like the Air and Sea Show or the Gay Pride Parade on Wilton Drive. They were collecting signatures right in front of, we had a long booth with all these posters up, they climbed the sign, and right in front of us, people, they were getting signatures at Gay Pride. Because what they were saying is, oh, sign this for, you know, classroom sign, say, sign this to save the Boy Scouts. And people just signed without reading what they were signing. So in the end, they got, I don't remember exactly how many they got. Remember they needed 66,446? I don't remember how, much they, how many they got exactly. But um, so what happened, so let me, before I give you the, give you the, uh, the uh, end of the story, before we put the cart before the horse. So they handed in their signatures. Okay, so the, here's the process. Once you get your signatures, your six months is up. That's your deadline. Now you have to hand the signatures over to the supervisor of elections. There's a count. Yes, they had more than 66,446. Now what happens? Well, the supervisor of elections has a choice. And this is true in all, all these other counties that, that, that lost. So the supervisor of elections has a choice to either spot check the petitions or they can check every single one. So in this case, the supervisor of elections was what? She was this gorgeous black woman that had been coming to the Dolphins since the 1991 when she ran for school board out in uh, wherever the hell it was, out west somewhere. And we loved her and she loved us. And she had only been a supervisor of elections for like a year. And we had a meeting with her and we said, Miriam, you gotta count every one because we know a huge number of them are fraudulent. You gotta count every one, please. She shut down her office. I mean, she didn't lock the door, but the office devoted itself for two weeks to checking every single petition. And don't you know, in the end, over 8,000 petitions were disqualified as being fraudulent. They did not have the numbers, and we won. That was amazing. It was amazing. It wasn't done. And to back up a little, when we first started this fight, we asked everybody to help us. Because remember I said we were foundering. We didn't, what are we going to do? Where are we going to get the money? How are we going to do this? It's 
the big guns. And we ask everybody, we ask, uh, you know, we asked Lambda. Well, Lambda offered to help us litigate over the whole situation, but we said, well, let's wait and see if they get the signatures. But nobody else would help us. Equality Florida would not help us. Um, nobody. Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Nobody would help us. And the reason they wouldn't help us is they said, you're wasting your time. You're going to lose. It's going to go to a vote. You need to start doing voter ID. I said, I can't do voter ID. I'm a sole practitioner. I'm and I've got this ragtag by a bunch of volunteers. I mean, you know, we can't do voter ID. We're not set up to do voter ID. I don't even hardly know what voter ID is. You know, so you do voter ID. I told Equality Florida, okay, you think I need to do voter ID? Will you please do it? You're Equality Florida. I'm just Robin Bodiford. No, they didn't do it. So we won. It was a big effing deal. And it was a wonderful thing. And as a result, we have Wilton Drive and the world is still on its axis if we lost my world would have crashed. <laughs> so it was really a big deal. It was a wonderful thing. And, and it's not something that's, I mean, the people, you know, small number of people that were paying attention knew about it, but in general, general, it's not something that's like widely known because it was just a small group of us that did it. It was, it was wonderful.